and the Grunendal. Is that quite a good translation? Not bad, not bad for an Englishman, good. Uh, ZS6 AKV. Um, you, you may have to help with some of these other words, because I've got a little sort of bi biops on you. Um, Hans was educated at the Witwatersrand Technical College. Yeah. Okay. In uh, telecommunications, and he worked in the telecom sector for many years. He then re-schooled, which is not a word I would have written, but it sounds a bit American. Sorry, Paul. Uh, in public relations and held several positions in advertising and public relations, mainly in the technology field. His most recent position was senior corporate communications consultant for telecom, a post from which he retired in March 2005. Uh, he did consulting work for telecom after that, when EE Publisher launched Engineer IT in July 2005. He was contracted as contributing editor to, and a year later increased his involvement with the magazine as feature editor, a position he currently holds. He became a radio amateur at the age of 18. Uh, his main interests are new technologies, propagation research, satellite communication. For his work in amateur radio satellite field, he was, in 1994, awarded M. Inge Honoris Causa degree by the University of Stellenbosch. And I know you've had an association with Stellenbosch for as long as I... Well, since I first met you, I think, uh, Hans. Uh, he produces a weekly one-hour radio programme called Amateur Radio Today. He serves on the council of the South African Radio League, I guess. That's those initials stand for. And is secretary of South Africa AMSAT and Executive Chairman of the South African Amateur Radio Development Trust. South Africa has already launched a number of amateur satellites, and Hans is now going to give us an update on their latest plans. Over to you, Hans. The Thank you very much. The microphone is switched on. <laughs> okay. Right, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Uh, most last year, and... Uh, yeah, nice to see so many familiar faces again. Thanks very much, Jim. Well, I'm going to talk about, there are a number of satellite projects, and if I have time, I will, at the end of this presentation, just give you a very brief update on the others. But the particular one that SAMSET is involved in is called Kletzkos, and Kletzkos is the Afrikaans word for chatterbox. So um, I figured out that uh, once, 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 of course, we... We are launching the satellite and it, uh, it actually is in orbit. I'm sure the name will change to something, something uh, more scientific or something. But anyway, what is the objective? It's to give radio amateurs in Southern Africa easy access to low Earth orbit satellite on as many of available passes as possible. And why that came about? Because when, when we launched some Mandela set, SAM said was given a three month opportunity to produce a, a type of transponder to, to be incorporated in the satellite. And we met our deadline of three months. Uh, didn't quite do the things we wanted to do, but we, we managed to do that. Uh, ultimately, it was incorporated in Zamandila set. Zamandila set uh, means um, uh, seeking or, or looking for new opportunities, uh, a pathway to new technology, if you like, and it's a, um, a, one of the African languages. The, the interesting part was is that um, although the satellite was complete, it stood for two years because some politics in Russia, it was supposed to have been launched from their submarine, and then, well, who knows who did what, Eventually, it took our president to go and talk to uh, Putin about it at the time, and then they decided it was an embarrassment for the Russian government, and they then offered to us a launch from Bakunur. So eventually we were launched. Now there was a problem. They said, like, because it was a technology demonstrator for government, or by government, the amateur payload was not that often available while in South Africa. People in the UK and in the US had far more use of the transponder than we ever had. I mean, we may be lucky we had one pass every second week. While in the UK, you would have like two, three, four passes a, a day for a week, and then it would move to other parts. So that caused quite a lot of negative uh, feelings amongst the radio amateurs in South Africa, and that gave the objective that saying, whatever we do now, we've got to build something that gives us an easy FM kind of like repeater in the sky 
so that people that are not interested in satellites at this point because they feel it's too complicated and too difficult will have the opportunity of getting the taste of it. And once they've got the feeling of being part or taking part in satellites, you'll find that, the, that many uh, will be bitten by the bug and we will get definitely a far uh, more uh, or increased number of radio amateurs involved in satellites. <coughs> but let's look at some of the payload. Simple 70 centimeter uplink, 2 meter downlink. A linear transponder of 20 kilohertz bandwidth is, is being planned. Uh, well, that of course gives you multiple SSB channels uh, and at least two FM channels. So we're not going to stop you using FM and we won't stop you using um, SSB. Uh, it'll have obviously a command uplink, a telemetry downlink, which will be in conjunction with the transponder. So it must probably be in the transponder passband. Uh, it also has a scientific payload. There's another group that is looking at building a satellite uh, that uh, was very fancy and had all sorts of funny ideas of folding panels and things like that. Uh, we call it SciSat, uh, which was uh, like a scientific experimentation satellite. Uh, that satellite seems to be moving very slowly at this point in time. But as part of that, they wanted to look at if you had a a very strong LED light, a light source on that on that satellite and you you, you uh, produce that light source towards Earth, you know, could you could you then receive it and could you use that information to actually look at, at, at computing orbits and things like that. So what they did is, is they produced this particular sensor uh, which is uh, called SciSet ILP Light Project which will then be incorporated in Kletzkos or in Chatterbox so that we will be able to uh, do some experimentation on s whether that is kind of like a logical uh, way to go or not for that uh, more sophisticated satellite. So it's really looking at research elimination of a satellite and to establish mathematical origins for application on science, including refractive index, light path losses and chromatic parameters. So as I say, at this point in time, it's very much uh, on paper and to establish a spin data and orientation dynamics. And they also want to establish grunt uh, equipment parameters ready for the uh, SISEC photon light experiments which they are, are planning for that particular project. All right, let's go to block, di block diagram. I don't think there's anything special in there. If you look at the block diagram, if you actually can see it, because it's always quite difficult uh, when you're far away from the screen. Uh, it, it has the, the usual kind of uh, things and I don't think I need to go into great detail of what you're doing. And if you see the, the legend, it, it basically will uh, talk about, uh, <laughs> it says unknown, then it says the SMZ supplied payload and then some uh, items were supplied by ISIS and Delft and uh, also some items were ISIS developed. And that was the original, the original block diagram. It's changed a lot because when we started pricing um, the various components that you can buy uh, commercially from ISIS or from any of the other uh, CubeSat providers, uh, it gets to a large sum of money. And if you translate that back into South African Rand, it becomes almost unaffordable. So we had to change our minds and we have a lot of people now developing a lot of these subsystems. And what we may ultimately only buy is the solar panels and, and the battery. And, or power module. The transponder is, uh, is currently, uh, uh, here you can see uh, uh, schematic or, or, or a print from the uh, software that's being used to develop the PC boards. It's interesting, the PC boards being developed in Dubai because the guy working on the project is working in Dubai for six months and he's actually <coughs> working on it. He's back in November uh, we've already found a sponsor to make the prototype PC boards for us uh, because it's, it's not every company that can make a PC board like it, but we found somebody that's been working on Roche boards, uh, which is being used for the square kilometer array systems. And uh, they have offered to, uh, to produce the, uh, the PC boards for us and the prototypes. So hopefully that by uh, Christmas, it's always a holiday time for us. I mean, everything shuts down from the middle of December to the middle of January. And hopefully uh, the guy that's busy uh, developing the transponder will have the first prototype going and must probably do some testing on the air and so on. Right. Uh, interestingly, the guy that's in charge uh, of the project is Hannes Kutzier, ZSX-BZP. 
And he, um, he sort of has some interesting things to say about the six stages of a project. And he says you need wild enthusiasm. Well, I think we've seen that here today. You also will go through delusionment. And I'm sure we've heard that from Amsterdam DL. I mean, you know, Peter must have been devastated when, when, when his, his government people told him what they were doing. Total confusion. And that happens all the time. I mean, you know, a project team of about 10, you'd be surprised how confused people can be on something that you decided yesterday. But, yeah. And he says, well, you've got to search for the guilty. The only problem is you never find them or her. They have to be gender sensitive. Persecution of the innocent. I think that's normally the problem. And praise and honor for the non-participants. Because they are on the team. And when they said life's launch, you have to tell everybody how great they were in non-performance. So that's Hannes' idea for, about what this project is all about. But, you know, we also had a problem when we looked at the space frame because we couldn't, we can't afford to buy that space frame. So we got one of our radio amateurs that has a garage workshop and he decided he's going to actually build the space frame. Now we said that's impossible, you can't do that. Well, here he is, Dion Kutsia, and... Uh, he uh, looked at some of the dimension specifications that were around on various websites. And to get started, uh, he had to look at the material available. So um, if he needed to look at uh, uh, architectural, ele architectural aluminium, a new state, uh, and, and the dimensions. So he really got to work with this. And then he said, well, okay, how do we go about it? We have to bend to shape. We have to join at the seam, machine outer dimensions, machine cutout pattern. And then the end section, you have to bend fastening flanges, machine pattern, machine screw thread inserts and fit inserts. Well, you know, it looked like an awesome task to me. And when I looked at it, I thought, he'll never do it. Well, here is the bending procedure. What he did is, this, <coughs> he first of all made a, made a mold. So he has got a mold where he bends... Uh, uh, and the mold is, the, the jig is made to the inner dimensions uh, and it allows for a 1.5 millimeter wall thickness and uh, he actually bent all, all the aluminium elements uh, using, using that particular uh, jig. And then he clamped uh, the jig for dimension stability during the machining. So he clamped the whole thing while he doing the machining and here you can see the jig with the, the pattern in the top plate uh, and also for cutting the actual pattern into the, the side panel. And here is where he's doing the milling on his, in his garage and doing all the drilling and, and so on. And yeah, three sections of the main frame. And um, here you can see the kind of like little inserts and the screws he's using and the kind of things that he made there, all the various mounting pillars and separators for the PC boards, and uh, drilling separator sections to be fitted to the mounting pillars, and then the, posi the positioning holes for pillars in the top and the bottom plate, and you can also see the breakouts there. And here's the assembled model. The only problem now is still got is, is that we don't quite have made this from the right material. But we have found the source of the right aluminium. Now the problem is is you can find aluminium like that, but you have to buy it in huge sheets, which again makes it very expensive. But we've now found somebody that's prepared to give us their offcuts, which are the right size and of the, of the right material for, for him to build that prototype or the actual one. Well, you also do service treatment, and you know, a boormarker plan, as I say, they say a farmer makes a plan, uh, or uh, a radio amateur always finds a way around it, and here's this experimental setup for sulfuric acid anodizing of the case. So, it's really homemade. Now, there are a couple of unknowns, too, in this process. First of all, the aluminium spec handling properties, the wall thickness variation. Because although you may get the right aluminium material, you've got to make sure that it actually the wall thickness is, is, is um, uh, sort of consistent and that there are not too many variations in it. And then the seam construction 
And then, well, what are the testing requirements? And we did team up now with a company that can do the various uh, necessary environmental testing and, and kind of testing that's required for a space frame like that. Well, what is the present position? Uh, tolerances are achievable. Uh, proven construction method. Not exact copy of the commercial models. Well, maybe that's a good thing because they may have sued us for copyright or something. Aluminium, not the specification right now. And the mass is a little bit too much. It's 260 grams, so we still have to work on that. Uh, flexible configuration. And we're also looking at alternative approaches. And uh, I, I saw an email from him yesterday, and he's presenting his latest update at a conference at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Uh, he's li he lives close by, and they have an annual uh, sort of satellite uh, symposium as well, beginning of October, when he's presenting some of his new ideas and another prototype. So unfortunately, it wasn't ready for me to show you today. So what is Glasgow's current status? Well, we finished the exploration. Uh, we've got the team together. Assembled uh, the capable team to address all aspects of owning and operating your own satellite. Because it's not only just building it and, and testing it and having it launched. Well, that's still a question mark, of course. Uh, but you also need to make sure that you can operate it properly and that you have uh, the necessary ground controls and the ground stations, etc. We've established contact with ISIS. Uh, ISIS has got a branch in Stellenbosch, oh, no, Somerset West, near Stellenbosch, in South Africa now. So uh, we've established contact with ISIS, and uh, well, you know who they are. We've learned a lot from Seaport. Seaport is the Cape Peninsula University of Technology because they built a satellite which is going to be launched at the same time as, as your satellite. Thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this, uh, just to give you an update of what that is all about. Uh, the prototype frame is completed, as I've shown you, and the transponder design is completed, and we are now busy with the final layout, and as I said earlier, hopefully that by the end of this year we will have a prototype uh, for testing. And the OBC design and development is also being carried out at the moment. So that's the story about Kletzko's. Uh, short and sweet, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Seaput Satellite. Uh, Seaput Satellite uh, is, is the, they're building two CubeSats. The one is a one unit, which is ready for launch. And I believe it's been shipped to ISIS now for integration with some of the other CubeSats. Um, it's, um, they're also building a free U unit. It's all built by students, although the one cube, the first one, is built, uh, uses quite a lot of, of uh, components from, from commercial suppliers, except of course some of the, the payloads itself and some of the software was generated by uh, about 20 different students who were working on that project. Um, the interesting one, perhaps interesting, is that it has an HF beacon on it on 14.099. Um, at the moment, it, it hasn't been programmed, but it will send some CW message. But the whole idea of that beacon, that it will actually be used in the Antarctic for the characterization of the X-ray antennas, uh, or the, which they're using to uh, do uh, atmospheric or ionospheric testing. Um, it's part of the Super Don network, uh, and hopefully this particular 14.099 will assist uh, them in characterizing the antennas on, on the Super Don, uh, antennas in the Antarctic and anywhere else where, that may, where they may want to use it. But the advantages for radio amateurs is that it provides you a nice signal to demonstrate uh, at schools. It also provides you a nice signal to actually um, test your own 20 meter beam uh, and, and see how well it performs. Because you have a known signal at a known time from a new unknown space. So interesting is, of course, the antenna. Uh, how, is, how do you get an antenna on 20 meters? Uh, it's an uh, antenna that's round up, like you see most of these cubes set, and then it, it's sort of like is, is, is uh, spring-loaded and it's pulled out. And then the other thing is, is that they also the students decided, no, but that was too boring. They needed a camera. So they've got a simple um, camera on board. And the camera is positioned in such a way that 
they can actually check that the uh, the antenna was was um, uh, fully extended. I think there was a year said one that also had something like it where they wanted to check antennas like it. And then there's another student group that this just came about. There's a, a company called uh, Donnell Dynamics, and they employ every year 20 graduates, either uh, BSCs or uh, masters or PhD students. And these students are given a project for one year. So 50% of the time they have to work in the job at the department where they are assigned to, it's either mechanical, electrical, software design, you name it, the whole spectrum. So they figured out by building a cube set would be an ideal project for those 20 learner engineers, what you want to call them, training engineers, interns, to actually do that. Now they cannot buy anything out, except for the solar panels and the power system they are allowed to buy. Everything else has to be. So they are also busy designing and building their own space frame. They are also building all these kind of things and that will uh, have a, um, a 2 meter 70 centimeter transponder on board. Uh, they are not really interested in, in in what is on the satellite itself other than that then they can have it launched and they can have telemetry on there and so we convince them but if you want to use amateur frequencies then you should provide some value to the amateur fraternity so we have an FM transponder coming on that so that may get launched before before uh, goes or Chatterbox because they have to finish their project by end of January uh, when they graduate out of their learnership into they get into full-time employment as engineers at that company and then of course they're looking for a launch and yeah you know, they're talking to various people and they're talking about as early as March next year if they're lucky that they be able to find a launch and be able to fund that launch so these are the projects that are going on in South Africa right now and uh, yeah we thought that some dealer said was the end but there's another project, and that is a government project. There's, there, there's a project called the, um, what do they call it, a resources um, constellation for Africa. And that is basically a South African uh, imaging satellite. Nigeria has already got theirs. And it will include Kenya and it will include Algeria. And they've now agreed that each one will build a satellite and some of them will build themselves, some may, maybe they come to, to, to you guys here in, in Guildford. Uh, I'm not sure, but the South African one will be built in South Africa. And uh, it basically Sunspace, which is the company that ultimately came out of the University of Stellenbosch when they built the first satellite, which, which uh, was quite, quite many years ago, uh, Sunset. Uh, they formed that company, and that company then also built Zamanila Set, and that company will be building, together with the University of Stellenbosch, will be building the, uh, the South African part of that constellation. And I've been assured by the engineers at the University of Stellenbosch that it will have an amateur radio payload on it. Now, if we don't get a launch for Zombandila, for, for Kletzkos, we may well take that payload and actually incorporate it. Because with government, you don't know. Their budget starts on the 1st of April next year. If the minister gets enough allocation from Treasury to get that project going next year, you know, we may get an, an, another three months again to say do it, or else you don't go on. So that's why we're looking at Kletzkos as two opportunities, either as its own or as an opportunity where we can actually uh, incorporate it or build it into, into the Constellation Satellite. So yeah, all I can say is watch the space. Thank you. concept of guides and brown is kind of a fairly youthful group. Uh, and are any of these satellites uh, suitable for reception by really just beginning amateurs, I mean, sub-amateurs? That, that, that's really what it's aimed at. 
Uh, it's aimed at some vague you know, connection with them. So if, if your satellites would be good for complete beginners, 11, 12, 13 year olds. That's what we're aiming at because, okay. you know, we, if we need to look for a launch, we need to get government funding for that. So the only way you can get government funding, if you can show them the benefits it, it will bring to youngsters uh, as, as a sort of way in having them getting interested in mass science and technology um, and sort of looking for careers in that field because that's always where the shortage is. You find you, there's enough students to get, take political science, there's enough students to take um, administration kind of subjects at university, but there's, if you really look at the kind of students that are motivated to go into engineering, there are plenty, but they don't have enough background. So when they get into university, they don't really have enough science and maths experience, and they, they have a hard time the first year, and many of them fall away. They, they fall out. So that's the whole objective why we're trying to make this, so that it's actually something that's very simple, and it has kind of opportunities where you can run little projects on the satellite. Like on the, the 14.009 beacon that's of the SIPU satellite, we have the right to put uh, various messages on there at slow morse rates so that you can actually use it, uh, you know, when the scouts get together, uh, you know, when there's a jamboree on the air in October well, exactly. and I'm so on. exactly. guides and brownies, that yeah. sort of thing. And, that, and, so that's, and that's really what we're in mind. i about that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Any on, this, any on the video? No. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much indeed uh, for your interesting talk.